I'm Aaron Porras, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, a massive scandal ends with 10 indictments in the same political party. Details about secret talks between the United States, Russia, and Israel are revealed. And an Israeli-German artist gives Twitter a big piece of his mind. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. There has been a huge breakthrough in one of Israel's deepest reaching public corruption scandals. State prosecution has just issued 10 indictments for Israeli officials from the Israel Beitenu party, including former Deputy Minister Faina Kirshenbaum, on charges of bribery, fraud and money laundering. Suspicions of the criminal activity first surfaced in 2015 and Israeli police have been investigating this case, known as Case 242, for the last two years. At the center of the scandal is Kirshenbaum, who became a Knesset member back in 2009 and served as the deputy minister for two years, that is, until news broke of her alleged criminal activity and she was forced to resign. This has been one of the deepest, most complex corruption investigations in modern Israel, and the state prosecution has put years of resources into building their case. So far, the Justice Ministry has netted Kirshenbaum and nine other officials from her political party in these indictments, which they're calling only the first round of more indictments still yet to come. Other party members indicted include the former headquarters chief, David Godovsky, former director of the Agriculture Ministry, Rami Cohen, as well as his wife, Batya, and a slew of other NGO and regional council directors. Now, the head of the Israel Beitenu party is currently Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman, and though so far he isn't implicated in these charges, Lieberman is no stranger to scandal himself. Lieberman was accused of fraud, laundering, and witness tampering in 2011, and confessed to assaulting a 12-year-old boy back in 2001. Investigators are clearly on the money trail, but with the current scandals heating up against Prime Minister Netanyahu and his wife Sarah, it may be an entire culture of corruption that ends up being exposed. Now, a lot of what goes on in the Middle East happens behind closed doors, but now details are coming out of secret talks that happened between Israel, the United States, and Russia to discuss the ceasefire deal in Syria and the establishment of safe zones for Syrian civilians. The talks reportedly took place in Jordan and an unnamed European capital back in early July, around the time of President Trump's first public meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin at the G20 summit. Allegedly, top Russian and United States officials were keen on establishing safe zones in Syria, but Israel objected and instead was pressuring Russia and the U.S. to focus on removing Iran, Hezbollah, and Shiite armies from Syria first. Clearly, Israel prioritizes the long-term threat of an Iranian foothold in Syria, even at the cost of safe zones to aid displaced Syrian civilians. So when the ceasefire deal was announced on July 8th from Russia and the United States, Israeli officials were reportedly shocked to discover that all their points and requests from the meeting had been completely ignored. In fact, they were particularly disturbed that neither Iran nor Hezbollah were even mentioned in the terms of the ceasefire at all. American Secretary of State Rex Tillerson claimed last week that the United States will cooperate with Russia in Syria on the condition that Iranian forces be removed, but it looks like the theater of war and peace will continue to march on. Following the incident at the Israeli embassy in Amman and the announcement of a Jordanian-Palestinian crisis committee over the Temple Mount, Israel-Jordan relations look to be at an all-time low since they signed a peace agreement in 1994. Well, here to tell us more and discuss these issues is Dr. Mordechai Kadab, who served for 25 years in the IDF military intelligence, and he's an expert in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you very much for joining me again today. Pleasure. So my first question for you is, what can this crisis committee actually do? Like, what should we be afraid of, of what they will accomplish? Well, this crisis committee is only one part of a much larger cooperation between Jordan and the Palestinian Authority, which is aiming at establishing a Palestinian state which will overlook Israel from the hills of Judea and Samaria, all the way from Dimona and Be'er Sheva, Ashkelon in the south, through the coastal area, all the way to Haifa in the north, Afula and Beit Sha'an, means being a strategic threat on the mere existence of the state of Israel. This is what they co cooperate on. However, this is a definitely shift from what was meant by the peace with, with Jordan, because when the peace was signed with King Hussein, he was totally against establishing a Palestinian state. Why is that? Because he thought the Palestinian state will be a danger for Jordan, because the Palestinians in Jordan, which are the majority actually, will like to unite with the Palestinian state, so it will jeopardize the stability and maybe the existence of the Hashemite uh, state. Today, uh, King Adala 
uh, uh, turn the whole thing over. Well, he says today that Israel should establish a Palestinian state on these hills of Judea and Samaria so he can kick out all the Palestinians, which he doesn't like, to, to our throat. And this is actually a, 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 strategic, a strategic threat on the mere existence of the state of Israel, which he is doing only to save his, his chair, which don't, don't, don't forget, he's an artificial uh, uh, king because uh, the British actually mm -hmm. brought his great-grandpa from Saudi Arabia to be the king of Jordan. So in order to save his chair, we have to sacrifice Israel. So my question for you then is, a, what, is this, what does this mean for Israel-Jordanian relations? Is, is this a falling out that is going to become more serious as, as time goes on? And B, what should Israel be doing about this existential threat? First of all, Israel should, should change the discourse. Because as, I, as it is until this very minute, Israel's officials, prime minister, ministers, uh, uh, army uh, officers, everyone in Israel thinks that the peace with, with Jordan is vital for Israel, and without Jordan, which is actually a buffer zone between us and the mayhem in Iraq, in Syria, in Iran, uh, actually uh, uh, the existence of Jordan, as it is a Hashemite kingdom, serves Israel. It is a mistake, because in order to resuscitate this country, we have to establish a Palestinian state, which will be an existential threat on Israel. And this is what Israeli officials do not understand. And this is the problem. They don't see beyond their noses. And uh, here I am, in order to uh, uh, warn mm -hmm. Israel and the world as well, because this kingdom actually works only in order to preserve the Hashemite family, not the right. state. Instead of creating a Palestinian state for the majority of the people in, in Jordan. And maybe if the Bedouins want another separate state, let them have another separate state. Mm -hmm. Why should we keep this artificial state only in order to undermine the stability of the state of Israel? All right, well, I think on that, it gives us a lot to think about, unfortunately. Right. But thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Israeli police have just busted a major cyber attack ring that's caused millions of dollars in damages through cyber attacks all over the world. The craziest part of that story, though, is that the masterminds behind the ring are two teenagers from right here in Israel. Though their names have not yet been released, the two 19-year-old suspects have just been taken into custody here in Israel. The Israeli police cyber unit has been on the trail for the last uh, year and a half, tracing millions of dollars of cybercrime damages to a website called vidos.s.com. Allegedly, the suspects sold services through the website called attack packages, which were then used to launch internet assaults that overwhelmed targeted servers with fake web traffic, ultimately causing a total collapse of the targeted network. Police are saying these services caused millions of dollars in damages to organizations all over the world when they found themselves unable to access their own private networks. The two teen suspects made over a half a million dollars for these attacks, money that has now been seized by the state. The good news is that the global investigation united police and intelligence communities from all over the world to create a joint effort between the United States, England, the Netherlands, and Sweden, and more arrests are still being made abroad. Well, the final verdicts are in, and now Elor Azaria, the former soldier who was convicted of manslaughter for killing an incapacitated Palestinian attacker, is going to jail. Azaria made a last-minute appeal to delay serving his sentence, but the courts rejected his request, and he is today starting his 18-month stay in prison. You would think the verdict would be a blow to Azaria and his family, but you wouldn't know that from the look of their faces last night. The family partied hard into the night with music and dancing, sending Azaria off to jail in style. And first thing this morning, Azaria reported to military prison to begin serving out his 18-month sentence, greeted by a crowd of supporters chanting, Elor is a hero. He made a mistake, but he didn't murder nobody. He murdered a mechabel that need to be killed, and uh, it's a mistake. Okay, you can pay him, not in jail. But this is just another step in the case that fiercely divided Israel all year. Video footage of Azaria killing an unarmed Palestinian attacker just minutes after he'd been incapacitated by a soldier went viral last year. At his trial, Azaria was convicted of manslaughter charges, which comes with a maximum sentence of 20 years in jail, and many Israelis were outraged when Azaria was given only a year and a half, with the possibility of parole with less than a year. Azaria has now sent a letter to IDF Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot asking for him to reduce his prison time and is clearly hoping to ride a wave of public support all the way to a pardon from Israeli President Ulven Rivlin. For now, though, Azaria will be sitting in jail waiting to see what happens next.
As corruption scandals and police indictments swirl around Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and his entire family, Netanyahu's Likud party is now organizing a no-expense-spared rally to support the troubled Prime Minister. The Likud party is hoping this can pull much-needed grassroots support behind Netanyahu. And there at the scene of the rally right now is ILTV's Brett Allen Smith. Brett, what do things like look like over there? Hey there, Aaron. So as you can see, we're here at the rally right now. It's the convention center in Tel Aviv. There's some press to my right in the back. You'll see the stage is just about getting ready. There's going to be music. They're hoping for a couple thousand people to attend to come out and show support Fight for Netanyahu. The party. So, who, so who are they? Who are they saying uh, we can expect to see at the event? Who's showing up? Well, the rumors are swirling. The biggest potential uh, attendee is Sarah Netanyahu herself. She tends to not show up to events like this. It would be a major public appearance, but there's also several other major representatives from the Likud party here, and they're hoping for at least 3,000 people to swell these wow. halls. That's amazing. Now, I, yep. know that, I know that this event came together pretty last minute, so why the yep. urgency? Why is Likud throwing this rally right now? Well, this, of course, comes, like you said, at a very uh, tense time for the Netanyahu, the whole Netanyahu family. Uh, Sarah, of course, is facing indictments for criminal charges. And, of course, Netanyahu has two scandals uh, right now that indictments may be coming maybe immediately. And, of course, his son, Yeo Netanyahu, uh, is being sued for libel. Um, last weekend, we saw protests in Petah Tikva against uh, the attorney general, hoping to, hoping to kind of push along these, uh, these proceedings against Netanyahu. There was a tiny little turnout of uh, Netanyahu supporters that was much smaller than the people there to protest against Netanyahu. So clearly the Likud party is hoping that a lot of people are going to come out and really kind of show support. All right. Well, I mean, as, as, as we can see, I think it looks like uh, the, the party is going to start at any time now, but not yet. Yep. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing how, thing, how things go uh, tomorrow after the rally has already, uh, has already happened. We'll keep you posted. Right, thank you, Brett. Now, we are always discovering new and exciting traces of history here in the Holy Land, but this latest find may be one of the biggest. Archaeologists are saying that they just discovered the lost Roman city of Julius, known to Christian believers as the home of Jesus' three apostles, Peter, Andrew, and Philip. These are pictures of what experts believe is just the tip of the iceberg, long, long proof of a large city known in the New Testament as Bethsaida, the city of Julius. Archaeologists had been hunting for the exact location for years, narrowing it down to several sites near the Sea of Galilee in northern Israel. And now this discovery, which historians are saying matches up with the reports of Josephus Flavius, the Jewish historian who kept records during the time of King Herod the Great. Ancient texts from Josephus recall the son of King Herod, King Philip Herod, transforming the small fishing village of Bethsaida to a great Roman city later renamed Julius. First of all, we are in a place which is very close both to the Jordan River and to the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And second, we have um, clear evidence that uh, this site existed in the Roman period, first to the third century, and the discovery of a bathhouse, the remains of a bathhouse, uh, at the site uh, show us that this was not just a simple rural place, but a little bit more than that, and that could reflect the transfer of uh, Bethsaida, the village, into Julius, the uh, polis, at the time of uh, Herod and Herod Philip, who was the king of this, this region. Uh, Josephus Flavius said that uh, Philip upgraded the village of uh, Bethsaida and made it a polis by the name of Julius. We think we have the first evidence uh, to say that this is uh, Julius of, uh, of Josephus Flavius. Uh, and other sites, or the, the other site that was excavated at Etel, did not yield any remains of, uh, any clear remains of uh, uh, city life. Some of the biggest finds at the site were Roman pottery, coins, and the remains of a bathhouse, which for archaeologists is proof of a massive Roman town. This is a major discovery for Christians too, who have long been calling it the lost city of Julius, and the birthplace of three of Jesus' disciples. Israeli PR has often spoken about the incredible humanitarian efforts that our medical specialists and volunteers perform, especially when it comes to the northern border, refugees, and emergency situations abroad, like after hurricanes and earthquakes. But how often are the medical specialists and volunteers themselves the topic of interest? Well, today they are, and I'm joined in the studio by Dr. Masad Barhum, the CEO of the Galilee Medical Center, to help me do just that. Thank you so much for joining me today and making the trip Thank to come you. down to the studio. So my first question is, tell me about the medical center. You know, what's, tell me about the demographics, the staff, what's it like working up there? Well, it's a very large uh, medical center, 722 beds, okay. with uh, 2,700 uh, employees, 
we are 2,700 si employees. 2,700 employees wow. and 300 volunteers. We are six miles from the border, 10 kilometers from uh, the border. Wow. Uh, we take care for uh, directly for 600,000 uh, community. 50% uh, are Jewish and 50% are non-Jewish. And we are uh, taking care for indirectly uh, with uh, for another uh, 600, 700,000. It means we take care for uh, neurosurgery. We are the neurosurgery, uh, solely neurosurgery department in the Galilee. Uh, uh, we are uh, taking care for, for example, hand surgery for the Galilee. A musculofacial wow. uh, for the so a lot of specializations. And a lot hospital. of specialization. That and if I'm and if I'm understanding these numbers correctly, you're telling me that with a staff of three thousand, including three hundred yeah. volunteers, yeah. you service over a million people. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that's amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. Now, uh, now you just mentioned that you're only ten kilometers, six miles away from yeah. the border. What What does a hospital of your size, of your importance? have to consider when you're that close to, to you know, what essentially What's, are considered enemy territories. I just remind uh, the Second Lebanon War, we were uh, the first underground hospital in that time. And mm. our staff and our patients and uh, 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 all the injured uh, uh, civilians and the injured uh, army uh, came to us and they were protected the underground. And mm. you know, the hospital was uh, uh, hit by direct uh, missile, oh, yeah. uh, the eye department, but no one was uh, hurt because everyone was underground. And we were the underground hospital, first underground hospital at that time. And we are, we are thinking about mm. the Third Lebanon War. Third mm -hmm. Lebanon War is going to come oh, one yeah. day. We hope not, but we, yeah. it's going to come. And uh, we're preparing ourselves to uh, uh, be more fortified uh, places, infrastructure, and for example, what you see, the emergency room, it's totally, uh, uh, totally uh, protected from uh, chemical and non-chemical uh, weapon. Wow. So, so you have a lot of security concerns considering your location. Uh, more, being, would you say exactly. more so than other hospitals in, in the exactly, country? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, 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 so speaking of your security con uh, uh, considerations, we understand that 70% of the Syrians who Israel helps, I think you told me this, that 70% yeah, of the Syrians exactly. that Israel helps and brings over the border come, end up in your hospital. Exactly. So what, 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 is, what is it like? What is, it, is it tension? Is it, uh, you know, this kind of... Uh, let's say let's say it's a very important humanitarian mission, and I am proud of my government decision. It's a government decision. I'm proud of my government decision, and uh, we uh, took it immediately when we were asked to uh, take the Syrians. Mm -hmm. We took it immediately. It's very important for us from a humanitarian uh, point of view. We say in our hospital in Hebrew, Adam le Adam Adam. And it's very difficult to translate it to English. It's that. people caring for people, something yeah, like that. People for caring. People caring for people, people. are people. Yeah, exactly. Something, like, something that. like that. Yeah. Human being uh, taking care for human being as human being. Yeah. And it was very important that we take those who think that we are uh, uh, their enemies, mm -hmm. and they come uh, to us and uh, we take care uh, for them. It was very mm -hmm. important for all the stuff, not only Arabs, the Jewish, uh, that we take care for them from so, the psychological point of right. view and from the medical point so of view. So just briefly, my last question, because unfortunately we've run out of time, but yeah. have you changed a lot of the minds of these Syrian patients who, sh who show up at your doors? Have they left saying, yeah. wow, we were totally wrong? I don't ask uh, too much questions, but uh, you can see the feelings that every, th every time you ask them, say, uh, we uh, uh, love Israel, we love you that you helped oh. us, but when they go back home, I'm sure that they will talk about that and what will happen, we don't yeah. know. Well, we should hope so, and, and we hope that they're safe after they leave your hospital yeah, doors. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Um, Dr. Bahum, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now the Bezalel Academy for Arts and Design is one of the best art schools in the Holy Land, and ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh went to visit the student exhibition in the school's industrial design department to see their final projects.
Bezalel University might just seem like an art school, but the industrial design students have a passion to help others through their art. Here's a look at some of the students exhibiting their final projects. Let's meet industrial design student Yochai Alush, who gathered inspiration from the youth in the town he grew up in. One of, of the objects is a stove. The chimney is linked to a concrete bench, and when the children lit up the fire, the bench is warm, heating up, and they can sit on it. The second object is like a bar chair, which you can pedal, and then you, you can create light for your friends. My name is Omri and I designed the Groove. Basically it's a case that turns your phone into a mobile recording device. The first push is to, to start recording. Me, 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 me. This is great. Zivo Dotti decided he wanted to help teach elementary school kids a thing or two about agriculture. It's supposed to educate the children, agriculture and the environment, patience, uh, responsibility, uh, teamwork, so the children can design their own uh, fruit tree. At first, each kid has a own uh, planter, okay. and they can practice and learn how to uh, grow vegetables. It's amazing to see such passionate students looking for different ways to help society through their artwork. Can't wait to come back next year to see the final exhibit of the new students and be shocked all over again. A German-Israeli artist has had enough of Twitter ignoring offensive tweets, and now he's taking that war right to Twitter's doorsteps. Twitter CEOs in Germany showed up at their offices this week and discovered dozens of hate-filled tweets tweets their company had refused request to delete, staring them right in the face. Lowlifes, Jewish pig, retweet if you hate Muslims, these are the tweets that German-Israeli artist Shahak Shapira is saying Twitter repeatedly ignored and refused to take down after users flagged them as hateful. Needless to say, Germans were pretty shocked when they literally saw the writing on the wall. <laughs> Das sind alles Tweets. Tweet. But this is exactly the point Shapira is trying to make, that if Twitter refuses to take down such hateful, hateful speech, then they should have to look at it, same as everyone else. I have in the last six months circa 450 hass commentaries gemeldet on Facebook and on Twitter. The Aussagen, die ich gemeldet habe, waren keine Beleidigungen oder satirische Aussagen, sondern Absolut ernst gemeinte Gewaltandrohungen, Homophobie, Ausländerfeindlichkeit oder Holocaustleugnung. Also Dinge, die niemand sagen sollte und, und auch niemand lesen sollte. Und dann dachte ich, okay, wenn Twitter mich zwingt, diese Dinge zu sehen, dann müssen sie es auch zu sehen bekommen. Shahak took 30 tweets that Twitter had ignored, prepared his stencils, and under the cover of darkness, tagged the streets in front of Twitter's Hamburg offices, all while filming everything along the way. Let's see if Twitter starts paying attention now. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for the Hebrew word of the day. If you're in a bright and sunny mood, then you'll love today's word, tzivoni, which means colorful. Well, to begin, we definitely saw a lot of tzivoni, or colorful things, in Jerusalem last week. Specifically, all the Dgalim Tzivoniim, or colorful flags, in the annual Pride Parade. Sure, rainbows are Tzivoni, light can be Tzivoni, and my hairdo when I was about 13 years old was also very tastefully Tzivoni. Finally, we've learned today that even our words can be quite Tzivoni, Safat Tzivonit, or colorful language, which, if you're standing in front of Twitter HQ in Germany right now, is probably not such a positive thing. The weather is brought to you by international singer-songwriter Sabina. Make sure to check out her latest album, Purple Ribbons, and get updated for upcoming concerts. Let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy with a low of 79 or 26 degrees Celsius. 
Tomorrow will be clear, uh, a bit clearer, and the temperatures are expected to drop to a high of around 89 or 32 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.60 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Aaron Porras, and thanks for watching.